I get a lot of questions about the tools on the wall behind me, which aren't just for display. In my spare time, I do enjoy using many of these tools. Some people want to know how many hand planes I have. Others want to know why I have so many hand planes. Still others want to know why I own all the hand planes in the world and how I can sleep at night at knowing that I have denied them a chance to maybe buy their own hand plane. Today I'll answer some of those questions as we tour the hand planes on the wall behind me. If you're into woodworking, particularly the history of the craft, you'll really enjoy this video. This time we'll focus on wood bodied planes, which include some of the oldest and most unique tools I own. In the future, we'll discuss the iron planes. Now let's start with the most common question I get. How many planes do I own? Well, currently about 200. A lot of folks think that's too many. Some have even been pretty nasty about it. They accuse me of hoarding planes and somehow driving up the prices. The fact is, I don't have even close to a full set of planes, if such a thing even exists. Well-equipped cabinet shops in past centuries would have had even more planes than I have. You see, these are not all the same plane. There are some duplicates, but many of these planes serve individual purposes. For example, these are all molding planes. They're the forerunners of modern rotor bits. Today, antique molding planes like these may be used to duplicate historic furniture and architectural moldings from the 18th and 19th centuries. For example, there's no rotor bit on the market which can make this complex profile. You may have a custom molding machine knife set made to match it, but it's much more fulfilling, I think, to make a 150-year-old profile with a 150-year-old tool if you have that luxury. As long as you don't have to make too much of it, of course. Because a plane like this with such a wide iron that takes a really wide shaving can wear you out in a hurry if you aren't used to it. Some large molding planes were even operated by two people. There was a master pushing from behind and an apprentice towing the plane with a rope attached to the tow. Planes like this with complex profiles are found all over the world, but they're most common in Europe, where early cabinet makers liked all-in-one solutions. Many early American cabinet makers favored a set of simple profiles that could be combined to create any complex molding they wanted. This is known as a half set of hollows and rounds. Round planes cut coves, hollow planes cut beads. If you combine coves and beads of various sizes, you can create just about any profile. For example, a common OG is simply a cove next to a bead. If you leave a flat or a fillet between those two shapes, you have a classical OG. And you can build from there, creating complex moldings one feature at a time. Of course, some profiles are so common that it just makes sense to have a dedicated plane for that profile. For example, here are some different sizes of ovalos, and here are a graduated set of edge beating planes. But not all molding planes are for cutting decorative profiles. Some, such as these rabbit planes, may also be used to cut joinery, such as rabbits, dados, and grooves. The most common and least expensive of these are those with straight cutters, which come in various widths. These perform well when cutting with the grain, but if you were a cabinet maker of means and had a little more money, you might instead buy skewed rabbit planes with an angled iron like this one. These cut with the grain as well, but they also work better when cutting across the grain. Another set of wood-bodied planes common to the old-timey shop were these matched planes. They're so called because they come in matched pairs for creating tongue and groove joinery, one cutting the tongue, the other cutting the groove. Match planes came in various sizes for different thicknesses of material. Many of these molding planes are quite old. Some date back to the 1700s. You can sometimes tell a bit about the plane by the maker's stamp on it if it was commercially made, but the style of the body can tell you a bit as well. For example, this plane features sharp bevels along the edge and a circular end to the wedge. This style is common to the 1700s, whereas planes made in the 1800s and later are more likely to have rounded edges and a more elliptical shape to the wedge. Believe it or not, as old as many of these planes are, they're not all that uncommon. There were just so many of these made, especially the common profiles, that even 200-year-old examples can be found regularly in some antique shops and flea markets. Others, though, 
are particularly unique and interesting. For example, these were handmade by a woodworker perhaps a century ago. Planes like these tell the story of our craft. You can see how this maker made tools from what he had on hand. The bodies were likely scraps of oak left over from a project. The irons were repurposed files that were ground down to make irons and given a second life. You can see the mark from the maker's gouge as he formed the mouth so long ago. These weren't toys, they were made to be used. He even reinforced this one with strap iron. Here's another story. This hollow plane, as near as I can tell, was made from a piece of window sash. The maker cared a great deal about this plane. He didn't just scratch his name on it. He carefully engraved his initials and the year 1828. Woodworkers commonly marked their planes, especially if they worked in a cabinet shop with other workers. Early planes may have been marked by hand like this one, but post-Civil War era planes were frequently marked by a stamp. One of the first things an apprentice might buy was an iron stamp like this one so he could leave his mark on his first plane. It was a rite of passage for a young man in a cabinet shop, but the stamps themselves are pretty rare today. These stamps not only tell the story of one man's plane, but they can tell how a plane was passed down through generations of cabinet makers, each of whom left his own mark on it. Stories like these are part of why I love to own and use antique woodworking tools. One of my favorite types of wood-bodied planes are these, which are sometimes called continental planes because they were once prolific on the continent of Europe, especially Germany. They are called horned planes also for obvious reasons, and old versions like these are like snowflakes. No two are alike. They often reflect the personality of the maker. This one is perhaps 200 years old and was carefully decorated with borders on both sides as well as behind the iron, and with what appears to be an anchor-like design ahead of the throat. I wonder if the owner used it in a shipyard or even worked as a ship's carpenter. Perhaps he also owned a plane like this one, which is most certainly a shipwright's tool. Its skewed iron is an inch and a quarter wide for cutting big joinery, and its offset handle is a sign that it was used to cut dados or rabbits in awkward places, such as one may encounter while building something large outside of a workshop. The sole of this plane is also very interesting. It has been repaired by adding an iron plate. This is further evidence that someone cared a great deal for this tool and he didn't want to discard it. You see, planes of this style were often used as smoothers until the sole wore down and the mouth around the iron became too wide. Then the iron might be ground with a camber so the tool would have a second life as a rough scrub plane until eventually the sole became so worn the plane had to be discarded. This owner added an iron sole to give his favorite tool perhaps a third life. Many of these planes were passed down for generation to generation, and by grabbing the horn and using the plane, you can feel the unique grip that was once so familiar to each plane's owner. These horns are quite comfortable and were often shaped to fit the user's grip. Some were made by carefully selecting a piece of tree root or a curved branch to make the perfect horn. This particular example is called a compass plane. It may have been used by a cooper on the inside of a small keg or vessel. This unique plane was also used by a cooper for a very specific purpose, to create the groove around a barrel's rim that held the bottom panel. You can see how perhaps hundreds of barrel rims have worn a groove in the plane's fence. Unfortunately, the iron and the wedge have been lost. While horned planes were favored on continental Europe, the English, and later the Americans, preferred coffin-style planes like these. This particular coffin-style plane has a special purpose. It's called a toothing plane. There are grooves ground into the surface of the iron to create a serrated edge. The iron is also set at a steep angle, so the edge drags across the surface, scraping the fibers. Toothing planes are good for many purposes. For example, one may be used to quickly clean up secondary surfaces such as drawer bottoms or even to plane highly figured wood fibers that might tear out with a regular plane iron. Toothing planes are also used in old style veneering to create a rough surface for a mechanical glue bond. Someday we'll make a video about how useful toothing planes can be. Often the crowning jewels of an early cabinet maker's toolkit 
was his plow plane. Many have decorative moldings and boxwood fittings. But don't let the fanciness fool you. They are hardworking tools used to cut grooves for drawer bottoms and back panels for cabinets and other such bench work. The irons may be swapped out depending on the width of the groove you wish to plow, and the fence is adjustable as well. Wooden plow planes like these can be a pleasure to use, and some examples are beautiful to look at. But by the time Stanley developed their number 45 iron combination plane, the age of the wooden plane was already nearing an end. That is for the next video. See you next time. I've been a proud Tormek user for years. I've never seen so many clever innovations from just one small company, and the quality is simply uncompromising. Even if you're not in the market for a new sharpening system, you should check them out and see what they have to offer at the link below this video. There's a reason they're regarded as the best of the best. Wait, don't go yet. If you're new here, please subscribe and remember to ring the bell. I would really appreciate that. Give us a thumbs up or better yet, leave us a comment. I always read them. And be sure to check out the latest issue of Stumpy Nub's Woodworking Journal. It's always packed with tips, tricks, and tutorials designed to make you a better woodworker.